As usual, please search for the tasks to complete for today. This is unit two, lesson seven. Um, we're reaching the end of our second unit here on communicable diseases. Uh, today I wanna to explore hepatitis B and HIV, two somewhat similar viruses uh, that we're just gonna cover the basics on. And we'll try to wrap up influenza a little bit too. Uh, before we dive into that though, um, so just make sure that you have found the task to complete for U2L7, either under assignments or on the homepage. And as usual, we'll start off with a little chat share. The question this time is going to be a little bit of a bigger one. Um, what's the best piece of advice you have ever been given? Could be from a parent, from a teacher, from anyone, or something you saw in a movie. What's the best piece of advice you have ever been given? I'm going to give you 20 seconds to think about it. Open up the breakout rooms. Functioning in order to function properly. Um, in terms of uh, hepatitis B and HIV spread by uh, parenteral transmission, which is kind of a weird way of just saying blood to blood. Um, and so, yeah, looking at this, and again, a lot of misconceptions here, um, but yeah, correct ones were um, unprotected sex in various forms, could be vaginal or anal. Oral sex sometimes, um, but it is much less likely than any other form. Um, the uh, transfer of transfusion of infected blood. So that's kind of scary to think that you could potentially go to a hospital, receive donor blood, and it has been infected with hepatitis B or HIV. Um, transplacental, which means it can cross the barrier from the mother into the fetus. But again, with hepatitis, that happens. It depends on what type of hepatitis you have. It can be up to 90% if it's hepatitis B. For HIV, it's about 30% chance of that happening. Um, it's not zoonotic or anything like that, which a few of you guessed those, which is good. Um, these diseases would be way more widespread if mosquitoes spread them. Um, and I can't see what the last option was again, but um, it's not from handshaking or from bathing together or sharing toilet seats. None of that happens, right? It has to be blood to blood. And so unless there's some weird circumstance where blood's out in those places, it's not gonna spread that way. Um, people with age and HIV also become infected with HBV. Um, very good, only one person got this, which is they actually show no symptoms. And that's because um, hepatitis B uh, destroys your liver using your immune system and your immune cells. And so if they're not functioning, then hepatitis B can't do anything, um, which is kind of an interesting thing. You would think that it would be a rapid long-term illness and resulting in death, which is what most of you guessed. Uh, and then how long can HIV be active and spreading in an infected person without showing? Uh, it is up to eight years. Um, they call that the um, clinically dormant um, period, uh, which is when it's just spreading, uh, but you kind of don't know it. So uh, these are all things we're going to address, and hopefully you will um, have clearer ideas about uh, by the end of this lesson. Um, but very good. Okay, so next task then was to dive into these next slides. So um, bear with me, I'm gonna go through, we'll tackle hepatitis B first, and then I'll put you in breakout rooms for round one of the breakout room reflections, where you'll be answering some questions based on what we went over. And then I'll go through HIV and we'll do the same thing with that. So let me share my screen again here. And as I'm going, if you ever have a question or a comment that you wanna jump in about, um, please feel free to do so. Um, I can hear you clearly and um, might help slow me down or help explain something if you're confused by something. So, oops, don't want to do that. Uh, I want to do this. Okay, once again, if I could get a verbal confirmation, you can see the hepatitis viridae slide in front of you. Yeah. All righty. So this is Gladwin chapter 25. You'll be reading about four pages of this chapter. And again, it can get kind of dense, so don't get lost in the details, right? Uh, these are some of the key takeaways. So hepatitis viridae is a whole class of viruses. Um, they attack the liver, specifically what are called hemato, um, hematopocytes, which are your liver cells. There's two types of infection, and you see this with a lot of different diseases. Um, so these are just good terms to know in general. Um, anytime you hear the word acute, you should think uh, rapid and severe, right? So these are viral infections that happen really fast and cause really, really bad symptoms. They make you really, really sick. Um, so acute hepatitis uh, viruses, uh, very severe symptoms, often result in liver failure in a very short period of time. Um, 
uh, and that's jaundice and things like that. Chronic, you should think long and slow, right? So these are attacks that are slow and methodical. The host usually shows few or very mild symptoms, even though the virus is spreading inside of them. Uh, and it will eventually usually develop into something more serious. And that's definitely something that's much harder to treat and much harder for your immune system to deal with because it's so widespread. There's a bunch of different hepatitis viruses for every letter of the alphabet, pretty much A through G. Um, again, we're gonna focus on the one unusual one, which is right down here. Um, it's the only example of a DNA virus form of hepatitis. Everything else are usually RNA viruses. Um, and a lot of you have been vaccinated against these, especially if you've traveled overseas. Um, hep C in particular um, is a common one if you want to travel somewhere. But again, it's all about basically taking your liver, the virus attacks, use your immune system, and um, causes cirrhosis or death of your liver cells um, faster than they can regenerate. So, uh, HBV. Anytime I say that, I want you to think hepatitis B virus. Uh, think big and bad. That's what your book kind of emphasizes. It's a very large DNA virus. Um, they call it the Dane particle. And I think your book talks about how it's like a great Dane almost. I like think it is a really, really big multi-layered virus. Uh, as of 2015, Global Survey, they reported 257 million cases of HBV across the world uh, and 887,000 deaths just in that one year of 2015. Um, so this is one of the most widespread viral infections on the planet um, is hepatitis B. And again, it attacks the liver um, and has a couple different stages of unwrapping, quote unquote, which I'll kind of get into as ways to fight it and ways to identify it. But um, just know that this is definitely a big contender um, and a virus that a lot of medical workers in particular get uh, exposed to because a lot of people carry it. So let's talk about the epidemiology. Uh, we mentioned in the um, little survey that I gave you, it's a parenteral transmission, which you should just think, anytime you hear that, think blood to blood. Um, so any kind of contact with that, whether that's sharing needles, which a lot of drug abusers are doing, um, sexual contact of various forms, um, I hadn't thought about tattoos and piercings and things like that. If you're using unsterilized um, equipment uh, and that's been exposed to blood of another person, it can definitely transfer that. Um, so these are all kind of the common ways. Um, again, medical uh, professionals too can be accidentally exposed by blood spray or a, what they call a needle stab or a needle, um, like if they accidentally get poked by one of the needles they've been using. And again, mother to fetus um, can happen with higher degree or lesser degree of chance depending on the type of hepatitis. Um, HBV is very spreadable. It's about 90% chance of spreading from the mother to the fetus. So the serology, which is basically just like how do we identify it? What are the proteins that give it away? Um, again, this is where I know this seems confusing. So just here's the gist that I want you to take from it. They have these weird abbreviations, okay? Um, HBSAG is just hepatitis B surface antigen, right? Um, which is basically just what are the identifying marks? These are like the sugars and proteins that are on the surface. It's like a name tag on this virus. And that's what's initially used for infection. So that's what every HBV virus has on it. That's how it's gonna affect our cells. Your immune system can actually create antibodies to fight against this. These are little proteins that essentially block it. And so if you have these, if you have anti-HBSAG, you are fully immune to hepatitis B. And this is what they use in the HB, uh, Hep B vaccine. Um, which a lot of you received at birth. Um, there's another one called the hepatitis B core antigen, HBCAG, and this is just present after infection. So if this shows up in your body, you've been infected. It's probably early stages though. Um, your body can make antibodies for it, but they don't provide immunity. And they're usually used actually to assess the age of the infection. How long ago did it occur? And then this is the serious one, um, HBEAG, it's hepatitis E antigen. This is a strong indicator of a very active and growing infection. If this is present in your blood serum, um, you have the disease and it is spreading inside of you and it's gonna spread to others. Um, your body can make antibodies for it, but there's no immunity. It just can reduce the uh, infectivity of the um, virus. So again, the key ones that you should be familiar with is the antibodies for the HBSAG, which is what the vaccine is used. That's full immunity if you're able to develop those or receive them. Uh, and if this one's present in your body, the HBEAG, uh, it means you are sick and you'll be showing other symptoms shortly. So the pathogenesis, how does it make us sick? Again, it can either be acute, which it just is fast and severe, or chronic, where it takes a long time to actually develop. Um, there's what are called asymptomatic carriers. These are people who received the chronic hepatitis, but their immune system basically overcame it 
they have those antibodies that I was mentioning earlier. So even though the virus is still present inside them, they're not showing any symptoms, they're not sick. Um, uh, the World Health Organization estimates there's about 200 million people in the world who are actually carrying the hepatitis B virus and are showing no symptoms because your immune system has dealt with it and it's not infecting cells, but it's still present in your body. There's chronic persistent hepatitis, which is just when it starts to give you mild symptoms that develop over a long period of time. And then the worst one would be chronic active hepatitis, where again, you have it for a long period of time, but with much more severe symptoms, very similar to an acute attack, but over a longer period of time. Um, again, it causes liver injury, and this I think is one of the big takeaways here. HPV causes liver injury by sending host, the host immune system into overdrive. So what's actually destroying your liver cells is your own immune system. And the immune system starts having trouble distinguishing between what's an infected liver cell and what's a healthy liver cell. And we kind of talked about this a little bit in the lungs with COVID-19. COVID-19 does a very similar thing in your lungs, where your immune system just starts being like, all right, let's just blow it all up. And that's not good when you're looking at liver tissue, for example. So it turns out people who are immunosuppressed, who have AIDS or some other illness that has weakened their immune system, they actually show no symptoms of HPV infection um, because there's no immune system to respond to infected cells in the liver. And so again, they also become asymptomatic carriers, um, just like what we were mentioning up here earlier, which I find kind of fascinating, right? You would think these are two really bad things coming together would be really bad, but it turns out not really. So in terms of prevention and treatment, um, again, know your status, right? So you should get tested to see if you are an asymptomatic carrier or not. Um, you should also avoid any type of parental transmissions. So make sure you're using protection during sex. Um, make sure you are checking, if you're at a hospital, make sure it's a hospital that has checked the donor blood, things like that. So again, yeah, testing donor blood and getting rid of infected bags is key. Vaccinating babies is the biggest step. We have a safe and effective vaccine uh, most of you were given it at birth. You have to have it in three rounds, basically. Um, and there are also a couple antiviral agents that are somewhat effective against uh, hepatitis B, but nothing that's been like a full cure yet. So, okay, I'm gonna throw you into breakout rooms now in pairs, I think. And I want you to reflect on the following. HBV is one of the most common viral infections in the world. There are estimated to be 200 million asymptomatic carriers of HPV in the world. What does this mean and how does it threaten public health? Once you've kind of come to a conclusion on that, go on to the second question, which is there's a safe and effective vaccine for HPV that can be given at birth or later. Why do you think HPV is still so widespread? Those same questions are also on the tasks to complete list on step seven under round one. So you can refer to them there if you need to. Okay, I mixed up the grade, the um, meeting rooms again. And um, all right, they're open. We'll come back together in about three minutes. Max, I don't think you're part of a room, right? Because you came late. So um, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assign you to a random room here right now. Sweet. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to throw you in with Tammy and Brandon. Go for it. <laughs> Realized very quickly that these people's immune systems weren't functioning and they had this other virus present and they eventually narrowed it down to HIV. So prevention and treatment, very similar to hepatitis B with a couple added details here because there's been so much effort into this. Uh, again, there's a big campaign about knowing your status and getting tested. Uh, testing is free as far as I understand at most clinics. You can get it at any age. They will keep your results private. It is mailed or digitally sent just to you. If you're worried about guardians or parents, um, as far as I understand, they are not legally uh, binded to inform them, right? You can be privately tested on your own. The whole point is that they just want to be aware of people's um, statuses. Uh, again, avoid any potential contact. So again, having safe sex whenever possible, never share needles, things like that. Testing donor blood, just like with hepatitis B. There are some experimental vaccines. You might hear a lot about this PrEP, which is now, it's called the, the pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, uh, there's TV commercials now too about a lot of medications that um, people who are HIV positive can take these medications and they cannot spread it anymore. So you can technically 
um, start having unprotected sex and, and your partner is drastically reduced in the ability to um, contract it from you. Um, there's medications, uh, again, those are ones that are gonna limit HIV growth once you have um, acquired it. Then there, there's medications to prevent or treat the secondary infection. So even though your immune system might be compromised if you have AIDS, there are medications you can take that are essentially gonna mimic the human immune system. Um, again, it's gonna stress out other organs though, like your liver or things like that. Um, but there are ways to sort of manage um, the symptoms if you have it and good ways to prevent it too. So I want to do another breakout room reflection. Um, this time I'm gonna have you talk about this. So there are numerous myths and misconceptions about HIV and AIDS. Um, I have spent a lot of time in uh, West Africa in particular um, as a Peace Corps volunteer and um, kind of learned a lot about this stuff and I'll touch on that in a second. Um, but this is a little PSA that I'd like you to just touch on. And so look at these different things here um, and how they're addressing them. So how do misconceptions like these actually make HIV more of a public health threat? That's the question. And again, that same question is posted on the tasks to complete under round two. I'm gonna shuffle the breakout rooms here. And once again, so that's the question, how do misconceptions like these, look at that image, actually have uh, make HIV more of a public health threat? I have that same image in the tasks to complete list. Uh, we'll come back together in three minutes. Go for it. All right. Sorry to cut that short a bit, I just realized that uh, we only have three minutes left and I don't want to keep anybody over. So any thoughts, anything anyone wants to share? The one that really gets me in that image, and this is something that um, as far as I, I came across uh, when I was in West Africa was this belief that if you have HIV, you can just have sex with a virgin and it will clear you up. Um, which from a public health perspective, I can't think of a worse possible belief to be spreading, right? Because then not only are you infecting yet another person, um, but then also just promoting this idea. Um, and just talk about like the perfect misunderstanding for a virus that is sexually transmitted and yet people think having sex can, can cure them of it. Um, same idea with like washing after sex or the, the pull out method, um, which uh, is usually means you're removing the penis before ejaculation. Uh, again, is a misunderstanding that it is passed through seminal fluids. So if, if there is seminal fluid present after having sex, it can increase the chances. Um, but even just the contact of the sexual organs, which are very thin and sensitive, um, there's not a lot of protection around those organs. And so HIV takes advantage of that by spreading in that area. So any other thoughts or anything anyone wants to share? All right, we're out of time, so we'll touch on um, the last little thing I had on there about the Gambia the next time we meet. Homework is at the uh, bottom of the tasks to complete list. Again, you're just gonna read very particular portions of Gladwin chapter 25 and chapter 26. I did my best to be clear about what I wanted you to read. Uh, I also have digital scans of the readings like usual um, that are usually around what you need to read, and there's a reading reflection and notes assignment as usual. So 